Great. Hello, everybody. I'm so delighted to welcome you to our live stream panel of Read for Action, the Humanitarian Book Club. Our project is at the center of humanities, public advocacy, and policy change. And we're based at the University of Virginia uh, UVA Humanitarian Collaborative Project at the Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy. And we're in partnership with the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. My name is Kirsten Gelsdorf, and I'm a professor and a co-director of the UVA Humanitarian Collaborative. And before I joined UVA, I also worked in humanitarian assistance for almost two decades. Um, at UVA, I'm working on this project together with Adrian Gali, who is a visiting fellow in English and also a um, practitioner fellow at the UVA Humanitarian Collaborative. And we have an incredible team of faculty, students, and other postdocs who've all been involved, including Noah Strike and Asima Bahamid, Lacey Wurzel, Will Evans, Mary Margaret Lee, Lee Lily Tortuva, and Sophie Trewalter. And at the UN, uh, we have some incredible collaborators that we're also working with, including Ruth McQuana, who's here with us today, um, and also Harriet Butterfield and Kirsten Mildred and other members of the Strategic Communication Branch. Before I introduce our panelists today, I just wanted to talk for a few minutes about why we created Read for Action and what it is, since I think for some of you, this may be the first time um, that you've heard of this project. So the project was uh, began because we, we and the UN had this fundamental question about how to increase and sustain public engagement of humanitarian crisis. So often when we hear and talk about humanitarian aid, it's kind of large headlines um, of despair. There's a lot of kind of doom scrolling that's happening now with people on phones kind of going through crisis after crisis. And there were some questions on are there other ways to connect to humanitarian crises around the world that maybe also don't involve just visual media. And so one of the questions was, is how can we use fiction? And is there a possibility that fiction can offer us a kind of more granular human view that helps us absorb complexity, find compassion, and most importantly, kind of connect to people and engage in these crises? And can fiction also maybe offer us some imagined futures that might help us think differently about policy solutions to complex challenges. So we created Read for Action under the concept of read, connect, and act. And so for the read aspect, we've chosen three contemporary novels that are all set in a climate or conflict or humanitarian crisis setting and read each book for a month. And this is the second book that we're reading. Um, our first one was The Displacements by Bruce Halsinger. And the next one is How Beautiful We Were by Mbolo Mbue. The next part is the connect part. So we're really excited. We have over a thousand Read for Action members and they're located all over the world. And how we connect is we're using an online platform called Discord. And on that platform, people can communicate with each other as they're reading. But beyond that, we also bring in literary experts and other authors to kind of talk about the beauty that's in these books from different perspectives. And we also connect with different humanitarian experts and thought leaders so that we can connect what the issues are that are in the book to other real-time issues. And the last aspect is the act where every week we think about different actions that are kind of pro-climate or pro-humanitarian that people can take on all kinds of levels. So today we're really excited that this is part of our connection aspect. And then we have one live stream panel at the end of every book that includes the author, another incredible author and a humanitarian expert. So I'm more beyond thrilled that today we have Mohsen Hamid with us. So Mohsen was born in Lahore, Pakistan and is calling us uh, from there now. Um, he's the author of five novels, including Exit West, the book that we are discussing today, um, and most recently, The Last White Man. His writing has been translated into over 40 languages. He's featured on many bestseller lists. He's been nominated for the Penn Hemingway Award and the Man Booker Prize, and his work has also been adapted for the cinema. And I'm really excited to have him here with us today. Our second author is Anna Badkin, who was born in the Soviet Union and now an American citizen. And she's author of seven books, most recently, Bright Unbearable Reality, 
which you can see from my tattered copy is very loved. Um, and she's been long listed for the 2022 National Book Award. And her awards also include Guggenheim Fellowships, the Barry Lopez Visiting Writer in Ethics and Community Fellowship, and an award for, from Psychologists for Social Responsibility for Writing About Civilians in War Zones. And our last guest is Ruth McQuana, who was born in Uganda and is currently a senior humanitarian affairs officer for the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. <laughs> Ruth has had an incredible career as an aid worker and extensive experience in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, and the United Nations headquarters as well. When we were reading our last book, The Displacements, Ruth was <clears throat> working on the response to the Pakistan floods. But Ruth is also a fiction writer and the host of a podcast called Stories in Humanitarian Action. So I'm really excited to bring everybody together today. So let me dive in. So most in one of the, reading your book has really, I was just saying to you before we got started, changed my perspective on so many aspects that I hadn't thought before, even after having a long career in humanitarian contexts and dealing with migration. And so I was, I was really wondering why, why you wrote this book. You know, what was it, what, what, what was it that you wanted to do with the book? And also, um, is there anything changed for you after you finished writing the book in terms of your perceptions and thoughts? Um, well, hello, and uh, thank you for, for, for having me. Um, when I was three years old, I left Pakistan for America. My, my father um, was and, and remains a university professor. And so he went off to do his PhD and my mother and I moved to California, uh, came back to Pakistan when I was nine, went back to America when I was 18, um, then to the UK for a bit, then back to Pakistan. And so I've been a migrant my entire life. Um, you know, my first language is Urdu, but I forgot it when I was three and I learned English. So English is my second language, but it's my best language. And Urdu, which was my first language, has somehow become my third language. And I don't really have a first language because my original Urdu is, is lost to me. Um, and my Urdu never became perhaps quite what it would have been if I hadn't left Pakistan. And, and so somebody like me, you know, who's gone through life migrating, um, uh, I guess partly and feeling you know, a bit strange um, how to fit in and how to become a chameleon in each place so that you don't stand out uh, and are, are less sort of a, um, have less of a sense of threat. Um, came up against you know, what felt like uh, maybe 30 years into my life, a real shift away from openness towards migrants. And in fact, a sort of uh, hostility that uh, five or 10 years ago began to take you know, increasingly um, frightening forms. I mean, uh, the, the Syrian refugee crisis, of course, was, was, was one of those, but, but we've seen, you know, just the rhetoric around migrants has, and the kind of militarization of the response to migrants was taking off. And so I guess in a way, I was trying to write a novel that grappled with this situation. And I was living in Pakistan at the time, and I thought, you know, what if I had to leave? All of my migrations have been voluntary. But what if in Pakistan, you know, terrible things are happening in Damascus, there are terrible things happen in Baghdad, terrible things happen in Kabul. These are our neighboring cities. Uh, you know, you can drive to Kabul in a few hours from the hall. So what if that happened here? And, and in the world where uh, migrants were, had become so unwelcome, you know, um, what would the re response be? What would I face? And, and that was sort of my way in. It was, I guess, a desire to write a novel um, that, that looked at, both this imperative to move um, and the resistance to it, um, and to see whether it was possible to somehow disarm um, part of that resistance by, by trying to explore whether or not um, we aren't really divided into migrants and non-migrants. We're divided into people who recognize that they are migrants and people who try to pretend that they're not. You know, Anna, that kind of, um makes me think about in, in your book, you mentioned that migrant first appeared in the English language in the 17th century as an adjective for animals that are changing place, right? I think you write, it's very etymology dehumanizes the non-settled. So I, I was just, I was wondering, I mean, you have so many beautiful 
thoughts and reflections and writings about migration as well in yours. I was, I was wondering for you kind of what, how that, how, what you've written and what you think about links to kind of what, what we find in Exit West. Um, thank you for having me a part, a part of this conversation. Um, I uh, am really enticed by the idea that these portals that I see on my screen are doors. Um, and doors, for those of you who haven't read Exit West, are play a, a significant role in, in the novel. Um, I was born in the Soviet Union and I migrated to the United States as an adult. Um, but I also worked in conflict zones um, before I left Russia and since I came to the States. And um, migration is um, such a preoccupation for everyone um, that myself and everybody I encounter because place is so fundamental to our humanity and what we do with place and how we withhold it from one another and how we bestow it upon one another and how we restrict people to a particular place or restrict people from entering a particular place. Um, in 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 Judaism, one of the names of God is Hamakom, which means the place. So this is how important places we name God after it. Um, so the question of that Mohsen raises in the book, the question of who belongs to a place and why, and for how long, and what does moving place entail? There's a, a line, um, Mohsen, in your book, uh, which I will not paraphrase, so I will find it here. Um, when we migrate, we murder from our lives those we leave behind. Um, so what also is migration, I think, is also a greeting, an encounter. So if you're saying goodbye to someone, you're also saying hello to someone else. Um, I want to, I think this is what writers do. We, we want to encourage people to look at uh, things, uh, situations in a new way. So I want to encourage readers to, and myself, uh, to look at movement in a different way. What is this, um, what is the connectedness that we maintain what is the missing how does missing envelope the, pl the planet how do how do our hellos how do our greetings rebate how do we say hello to one another and how do we say hello to one another when we think of migrants as animals and unwanted how do we then incorporate um people who come from someplace else into our place into our lives so I think that's where the the thinking, um, that's probably why you asked me to be here um, because this is what uh, I think about migration. Ruth, I, you know, I think I, in the United Nations and in the humanitarian system, one thing that's I think kind of interesting in juxtaposition to Exit West is right, we define displaced migrant or refugee. And there's actually like different organizations that are responsible depending on those terminologies, right? And so I'm just, I was curious from your perspective also as somebody who was, you know, is working in this space, like how, how, how did the book and its kind of views on migration and all of those things both Im impact you personally and kind of from your professional side? Thank you, thank you, Kristen, and, 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 and thank you. And I think to me, thinking about it, I like to kind of step out and a little bit how I'm very much a proponent of fiction 
and what fiction can do out in the world. And we are having this conversation and it's great to see a lot of people. But I do want to actually start with a quote from one of Anna's essays. Just real quick, I'm gonna read it from the essay, The Pandemic, Our Common Story. And here she says, catastrophes often bring to the fore what defines our humanness, longing, dread, soccer, love. Once in Afghanistan, um, on a gallant winter night in the middle of war, I spent a night in the living room of a border police detective. And the last thing I saw as I drifted off was my host, his Kalashnikov over one shoulder, gently spreading an extra blanket over me. An impromptu act of kindness, simple and immense. Um, now, this, uh, this is not fiction, this is nonfiction, but I think to me, it, it, it speaks to the complexity of humanity in that very small except with the kindness at the backdrop of conflict and war. One of the things I really, really liked about Exit West is meeting Nadia and Saeed at the beginning of the war, because I tend to feel when we look at immigrants, displaced people, refugees, they're always an unknown mass. We always talk them in, in groups. And when we respond, if you look at the earthquake now, everyone who's gone there with a few exceptions of people who are already living there, every expert, everyone who wasn't living in those villages and the communities of people affected, they don't know these people. And all of the reporting is about the large numbers of loss. Now, meeting uh, Sayed and Nadia at the beginning of the book, these refugees already, the conflict is starting to break up. But to me, he was really looking at these two young people going to class, falling in love. And, you know, they have jobs, meeting their families. Nadia has moved out of her home. They are going on a date and then going on that journey with them as, as people who are falling in love, who are having, you know, these um, challenges, and then that are caught up in this situation and are forced out of, 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 of their city. To me, that is, was extremely powerful. Um, and I was very much invested in these characters in a way that responding to a refugee crisis or displacement on an earthquake or reading about it or seeing photographs was unable to do. Yeah, that really struck me as well, right? I think this, I, there, uh, there's, there's a lot of thoughts kind of on that I had on kind of rethinking migration, but also a lot of thoughts on this focused lens on kind of what happens to daily life at the start of a crisis, right? We don't usually, like usually at the start of a crisis, you see these large headlines like you're talking about, right? How many people, bombs, this or that, but you don't see the inside on like, how is daily life changing and how is it not changing, right? Or like how are objects different, right? I think there's, there, how are relations different, right? So the relationship that maybe Nadia and Saeed had with their cell phones, the relationship to windows, the relationship to communication. And, you know, and Anna, in your book, in you also talk about that the beginning of, of COVID, right? That you kind of, you talk about, it seems you also bring to kind of how the start of that crisis kind of shifted things that you were thinking about. So I was, you know, I was wondering kind of how, um, how you, Anna and Mosin also see, did, was that deliberate to kind of focus on the, be the beginnings of this? Even though I will side say one, one of our Read for Action members was once saying, it's interesting because we meet the characters and it seems like the crisis is just starting, but you can tell that, you know, there are moments where Nadia and Saeed are kind of stepping around refugees, right? So the crisis is already there, but it, it's not, they're not in it in the same way. So I was wondering a little bit about most in like what you, how how you how you crafted all of that and what your thinking was about the start. Um, there's so much I want to say in response to what Anna and Ruth have already said. I feel like I'm sort of hurtling ahead to the next question. Um, uh, let me try to answer your question, and then if I can circle yeah. back uh, to some of the points that, that Anna and, and Ruth uh, raised. But um, in terms of in terms of uh, what we might imagine to be the story of the refugee or the migrant or the displaced person. 
Um, you know, very often what we highlight in our stories is, is that moment of, of displacement, you know, the moment of arriving at the border, the moment of crossing the Mediterranean in your small dinghy or, or the US Southern desert, you know. Um, and, and, and those of us who haven't done those things can look at that and say, oh, well, this is a completely different kind of person. I've never crossed the Mediterranean in a small dinghy. I've never, you know, made my way through um, the U.S. Southern Desert with just two liters of water and my kids, you know, uh, at my side. Um, that's just somebody different. But but those moments, you know, um, important and in some cases, you know, deadly though they are, um, are of course just a tiny part of the story of a human life. And you know, the, the real story, or, or not the real story, but shall we say the majority of the story is somebody living someplace and then somebody living or trying to live someplace else. Mm -hmm. And if we simplify the story to that um, and to imagine it has three parts, a middle part that we focus on sort of you know, all the time, but, um, but that also lets us think of this character or these characters as something different from us. Um, there's also the first part, before you move and the third part after you've moved, which every single one of us has also partaken of, you know, when we grow up and leave our parents' home, when we leave our town, you know, when we change apartments, when we move countries, whatever it is, everyone has lived somewhere and then lived somewhere else, even if somewhere else is just down the street. Um, and so I think for me to, to re-emphasize that beginning and after part of the story was very important because it establishes a link that you know all human beings can share mm -hmm. and um you know uh, anna mentioned the idea that um you know this notion of, of of murdering from our lives when we move and i think uh, you, you know for me the 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 notion there is is that you know migrants play an enormous price you know there's often this notion that somebody's tossed up you know what have they done to earn our welfare state or our well-maintained roads or put their kids in our schools, what price have they paid? They just sort of tossed up here. But the truth is that nobody can pay a higher price than somebody who has migrated in that way, right? Because they have left behind everybody and everything. Almost all the people they know, the food, the language, the smell, everything. Um, and so there's an incredible emotional violence that accompanies leaving a place, you know, seemingly forever. And, and I think it's important to acknowledge that, not because the migrant is doing something horrible by moving, but because, but because there's so much pain involved in the movement. And I think that's important uh, because um, when we turn away from that pain, which we do all the time, we, in a sense, close off um, a part of our humanity. If you think of the migration stories of America or Australia, you know, places like this, um, it's people arriving, you know, with their eyes sort of set on the horizon and, and heading forth into their new life. We never think about people arriving and being deeply homesick, missing their families, missing people they love that they will never see again. And because we've denied that part of the story, in a sense, we deny to ourselves, I think, part of the um, the pain and the sorrow that we each experience in our own migrations. And because we spent our whole lives denying how much it hurts to never to be able to go back to the elementary school that we used to play in, um, or to see our kids, you know, friends who were kids when they were seven and now they've moved on. Um, we deny this to ourselves. And so therefore it becomes very difficult for us to open up to accept the suffering of others because we spent an entire lifetime denying an equivalent suffering within ourselves. And so, for me, beginning in this way and talking about what happens before and explore, exploring, in a sense, the sense of loss is not just a question of humanizing the migrant. It's also a question of humanizing the person who has denied a similar suffering that maybe they have experienced just in the process of getting older. Um, and so that for me is really at the heart of, of you know, why the book begins like that and why it tries to travel in those things. It, it is, it is it, a kind of alchemy of, of opening up to the reader, their own migrant nature and the suffering that that has involved, which perhaps they have denied. And if they confront um, or accept, allows them to be perhaps more open to the suffering of others. And there is this misunderstanding that persists 
misunderstanding of identity and misunderstanding of history and misunderstanding of, as you put it, Mohsen, the price. Um, how many people in the United States where I live who have come here from someplace else who have survived uh, war or famine or dictatorship uh, have have been told you're so lucky to be here and what kind of baggage do we carry with us when we move from a place of hardship or a place of danger to another place that might also still be a place of hardship and how that baggage goes unrecognized and how the identity keeps being mistaken. And you have at the very end of, well, toward the very end of the book when Nadia gets a job uh, at a co-op in Marine, uh, she, uh, she, she, Nadia throughout the book, for those of you who haven't read it, wears an abaya, a black robe um, by her own choosing. And, uh, and uh, somebody in the co-op says um, if her family, maybe her family was oppressing her, this, this idea that, oh, if you're, you know, if you're covered as a woman, then it must be something that your family is putting on you. Just this complete, without asking questions of who you really are, your identity is being bestowed upon you. And since we're talking about identity and also following up on what Ruth has said, I don't think at least not in my experience, I don't think that people self-identify primarily as migrants. I think migrant is an imposed identity, is what non-migrants or migrants like me say about the group, right? It's, it's, uh, it's like nobody will call themselves exotic except for but people from outside will say this is exotic, right? So this imposed identity and this imposed burden or lack of burden and this imposed sense of danger and this input that all of this is an outside view of an um, abstract group. Whereas what Exit West gives us, what fiction, what good fiction gives us, what good literature gives us is and nuanced inside view, internal look at what it is to be human in this situation, not what it is to be the situation in a human body. Yeah, and if I can just come to that as well, um, Anand, you're absolutely right. I think I agree with you. you know, I think these are levels that um, different systems have put up you know, on, on people maybe to manage the way programs uh, and assistance, suddenly at least uh, in the United Nations where I work. So once you're labeled a refugee, you know, then the UNHCR, the, you know, the Convention for, for Refugees kicks in to look at what kind of rights and, and privileges that you, you know, that can be availed to you if you're internally displaced. Um, but yeah, the people rarely, you know, identify that way until sometimes, you know, I think they are forced to. But I did want to come back also to the point, Marcin, you mentioned around the emotional pain. I think both of you have actually spoken to with the emotional pain, what people lose when they are forced to move voluntarily or involuntarily. Um, and I feel like, at least in my work, this is not something that we speak a lot about. We tend to focus a lot on the material needs of people who have been displaced, you know, food, uh, shelter, water, sanitation, all important things, but the other aspects, the emotional loss, I think this is something that we don't talk a lot about. And one of the pieces that really struck me in the book as well was that moment when Nadia arrives in, in London and has a bath and she hasn't had a shower for so many days. Um, and so she really enjoys this, this shower and this distinction between her and, and Saeed. And she just feels, I just want to enjoy my shower. And to me, that being so relatable, it seems like a very simple thing and yet so powerful and it's so important. 
But just to really, for me, again, articulate all of the things that we don't really talk a lot about when the focus is so much on sometimes just really getting through the day um, and surviving. I think that it's the these multiple additional lenses, I think that impacted me so much, right? And especially like Ruth, what you were saying, right? These concepts of thinking about where our humanity comes from or where our connections come from. And then on, on the migration side, um, you know, Mason, there's two times in the book as that you go to the first person plural. One, the quote that you just mentioned, right? When we migrate, we murder from our lives, those we leave behind. And then the other time is what Anna, I think you were also, or uh, most of what you were referring to earlier, we are all migrants through time, which is kind of comes from when you introduce us to the woman in California who has not left ever, but has seen everything change around her. And so I wanna just kind of ask you a little bit about the choice of switching into the first person plural for those two moments and also, you know, adding that second part in this, we are all migrants through time. Well, um, I think that, you know, in a sense, this, this can all trace back to what I think fiction, you know, does, like what written fiction in particular does. Um, so, you know, we have a number of different storytelling, mass produced storytelling modes at the moment. And, and the dominant mass produced sort of fictional storytelling modes are probably television and, and, and cinema. Uh, but you know, even more television now than cinema with streaming. Um, and when in that mode, what you tend to do is you look at a screen which shows you a world that looks a lot like our world for the most part. Like people look like people and trees look like trees, buildings look like buildings. You can hear them talking. Um, but you know, when, you, when you pick up a book, like you, you know, you're, you're the viewer of, of, a, of a film or a TV show, but you are not the viewer of a book. You know, when you pick up a book, you encounter something that looks nothing like the world at all. You know, it's these little characters and spaces and blanks um, uh, on, on a page. And somehow that becomes people and emotions and images. Now, I think the reader often imagines that the writer is doing this, that the reader is just sort of sitting there and the writer is somehow creating these images. But how is that possible? when the writer isn't present, right? There's just this book. Um, what's actually happening is that I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, novels and, and short stories are an invitation to play make-believe together, you know, as we do as children. When two of us get together and say, okay, now we're gonna be pirates, or now we're gonna play, you know, astronauts, or now we're gonna have a tea party. And you sit there with your friend and you sort of, you know, enact this stuff and you're living in this world. And, and children do this all the time, you know, almost universally. We seem to be drawn to enacting, you know, participatory fantasies together as children. And then we grow up and somehow we think this is not a very nice thing to do. And you know, it's just some immature or something wrong with this. Let's just not do it. And so we, we tend to do a lot less of it as we get older. But when we pick up a book, we do it again. We just do it in a sense with the, um, with the safety of being in two separate places. The writer has done it separately in one room. Um, where you know he or she was sitting when they wrote the book, and the reader is doing it in a different room, um, you know where they are sitting and where they are encountering this, uh, and and so separated by distance and time, they are playing make believe together. Now, what happens when a reader plays make believe in this way? It's very different to create, say, the Nadia, uh, which is what every reader does when they read the book. Who is their say? Who is their Nadia? What does their city look like? You know, all of that is something that the reader creates with prompts from the writer, but the reader is creating. And I think, I think the, the effect of that um, is, is that the reader has imaginatively made a world, inhabited that world, you know, created it, uh, co-created it with the writer. And when we create something in our imagination, we have a very different relationship to it. We're no longer viewing from the outside. You know, we are animating from within. And so that blur of I and you, uh, 
you know, um, uh, Anna was speaking about the, the Jewish, you know, uh, word for God, or one of the Jewish words for God. But in, in many traditions, including in, in, you know, for example, the tradition of, of the Jewish uh, theologian, Martin Buber, there's this notion of this I-thou relationship. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, in a sense, it sort of collapses. Is there an I, is there a thou, what is happening there? And of course, the Sufis will tell you something very similar within a um, uh, Muslim poetic tradition. And every culture has some version of this, where we break down that barrier between I and thou, between you and me, between the divine and the human. And so I think that's what fiction really does. Um, that reader-writer relationship is one where something breaks down. And so eliding from I and you, or say the Nadia, he and she, or whatever, to we, um, is, is what novels are basically doing. They're opening up a domain for people to relinquish this separation um, and kind of step into a new place that they've helped create. And, and the last thing I'll say, and this has been a very long answer, but the last thing I'll say is that that for me is very fertile. A reader in that state of creating something in their imagination is in a very fertile state. The same way that when my son pretends to be a dinosaur, it's a very fertile state. He wants to be a, you know, a deadly T-Rex. Uh, who can strike fear into me with his gaze and his roar in a way that he doesn't as a, a 10 year old boy like walking around the house. Um, and, so, and so I think, you know, for me, um, that really is, is one of the great potential of, uh, potentials of fiction. The participatory role of the reader and how the reader isn't just passively absorbing what I have to say. The reader is imagining something into existence for themselves. And after we imagine something into existence, we are no longer the same. And I saw you, I saw you writing as he was talking. I was, I was wondering how you would reflect on that. The, you in your book also mention um, in Islam, the word for the concept of predetermination has the same root as the word for book. Perhaps this is because books allow us to foresee. They say great writers have the gift of foresight. So maybe kind of taking what Mohsen was just talking about Right, and I love this idea of <clears throat> the reader in the fertile state. Do you think there's also something about allowing us to see, right, these other imagined futures in reality, right? In most, in the book you mentioned, right, at the very end in Marin, they talk about, right, um, the apocalypse appeared to have arrived, and yet it was not apocalyptic. Which is to say that while the changes were jarring, they were not the end plausible, desirable futures began to emerge. And so in some ways, like what you were just talking about is I felt myself in that fertile state of almost feeling hopeful about a world in where there were no more natives, right? It was all migrants and people were using doors to go from London to Namibia. And, you know, sorrow and hardship was blended with compassion and shame and love and all of these things. So at this you know, this, I, I, I felt as that what your book did is what you were just describing, but I'm, I'm curious for the, for the, for the other panelists, kind of how this idea emerged or landed. Well, I was in a fertile state there when Mohsen was talking. Uh, I could have listened and listened. <laughs> um, um, I think the task, again, you know, I, I don't, mm, I write fiction and nonfiction uh, and I don't discriminate. Uh, I think that the task of a writer is to, to ask questions that allow us to set ourselves. This is why books, great books survive time they migrate um the questions i want to ask today the earth's and still we continue to on top of the earth's uncertain crust why the questions i want to ask are how do we how do we tap into the connectedness, not the difference? How do we 
how do we prepare ourselves for the burden of others? How do we uh, prepare ourselves for the suffering of the person we will meet after this conversation at the bakery or um, you know, in the coffee shop? We have no idea what their story is. So maybe the task of the writer is to prepare for the abundance of stories and for the abundance of suffering and also for the abundance of joy. Um, I sadly do not envision, I <laughs> do not envision a world with no suffering. I do not envision a world without violence where fundamentally very violent uh, animals um, but I do imagine a world in which we reflect more. And I think that's, again, that's what Mohsen, I think you were talking about. It's an invitation to reflect uh, together. And, you know, we both know, all three of us know as writers that once you've written a book, it no longer belongs to you. People will interpret it in their way. And that's the magic of it. And it's very, um, counterintuitive to you know our massive egos as writers right but we, we basically will let it go in there and it's yours now it's it's the readers now and whatever you play act in your mind with this book of fiction nonfiction, of poetry um that is your world building so you know the idea when you were talking about Mohsen when you were talking about um prompts I thought oh yeah that's this is how we construct a narrative we s set down a set of prompts that's what a narrative is because nobody writes you know every second of every minute of every hour of every day you write sporadic notions you write this is what I saw you write this is what Nadia did or what she was told and then we construct the space in between so that's, I think, where we can, where writing has power is that we do have power to, to set a set of prompts that can guide in a particular direction. <clears throat> Ruth, what are your thoughts on this? No, thanks. And um, I really like the, um, the, the idea of, you know, when you have a book with yourself um, and then you're in conversation with yourself uh, about the book and, and the ideas. And I think as we absorb, you know, fiction and, and stories in a way, um, I feel that it allows us to also question and and, and think through a little bit. But to me, one of the things that is very powerful about It Sit West is as I was reading it, I really wasn't thinking about immigration, frankly, or, or, or refugees. I was actually really thinking about these two people, Said and, and, and Nadia, and this situation that they found themselves in. You know, I remember the moment when, um, and also and the reason I say it as well, because I tend to feel like with conversations around displacement, migration, refugees, it's so easy for people to be pitched as the other who are so different from us and who we don't know. Um, and so in the world that the book yes, you know, I do feel like I know, you know, I know Nadia, I know Sayed. I can relate to when Sayed loses his mother. Um, I can relate to a window becoming dangerous when, you know, a few days ago, I was actually losing it to, you know, to bring light it into light into um, in my room. I can really, reading the book, I was able to, at least for me anyway, to feel that these are people like me who really have uh, been thrown into this situation. It could have been me, I could have been born in that city. And then I would be really relying on the kindness uh, of, of other people. And to me, I feel like that's really well done with in the book. 
it creates a lot of empathy and compassion, but at the same time, having able to really help understand what it is like, if that is even possible to go through that situation. But I also like the idea of doors very much. And I don't know if it will be time to speak about the doors at all, because, you know, to me, it was a little bit of magic realism. And on Discord, I think there was a lot of uh, in the chat group about the doors. But the idea that you can be transported from one place and not have to deal <laughs> with the bureaucracy of, you know, a visa. And a lot of people who are displaced, frankly, don't have passports, don't have identity documents. Um, and all of all money for that matter to be able to, to, to take a flight. But of course, even the doors, you needed to have money to have access to them. But suddenly it's really to me bringing together what it is like to be human. Anna, I agree with you. I also don't think that the world is going to be peaceful. I believe, you know, it's, it's, it, it, the violence is going to continue. Natural disasters are going to continue. And in many ways, all of us are going to be affected. So how can we live in a way that is actually aware of that and perhaps open us up to be able to help each other to make it through? I think I, I agree, Ruth, with you and, and with Joanna about the idea that you know, the world is unlikely to become a non-violent world. Um, and at the most basic level, you know, if you are a, a mortal being that's here for a temporary amount of time, just that fact contains within it a certain violence, right? I mean, each of us ends. Um, so there is something fundamentally violent to, to a human life, um, aside from the violence that we perpetrate you know, on each other all the time. But I think what's interesting is, and in both of you spoke about this, is, is um, uh, do we see in the violence that we face in being mortal and getting older and moving? And, and moving, of course, is one of the reactions that any species of animal has in the face of stresses. You know, if we are to take away movement from any animal, um, we, we dramatically, you know, circumscribe its, its possibilities. And our species has moved so much um, that, you know, if we were to try to stop it from moving, we would be entering into this new, completely ahistorical and strange environment. Um, and so, you know, the idea of these doors, which you talked about, Ruth, and, you know, sort of almost magically transporting from place to place, they are, of course, you know, um, a bending of reality, but they also basically exist in the sense that right now we're looking through these windows when we can speak to them and we can see through them. And if we chose to move people um, almost instantaneously in a matter of a few days, or certainly not more than a few weeks, we could move incredible amounts of people very cheaply. You know, we move containers across continents for almost no cost at all. Um, so, so in a sense, it is, we only pretend that these doors don't exist and we pretend by erecting walls that prevent them from existing, you know, bureaucratic walls and legal walls and, and, and walls of violence. But, but, you know, our world could very easily be a world where one could move just like this. It's we're choosing to have to resist, um, uh, that world. And I, I think that, you know, for me, the last thing is, is that, you know, as the pace of change accelerates and as we are going to see, you know, on, on, on a sort of almost, you know, planetary level, uh, seas rise and rain patterns change and, you know, fields become arid and other places become fertile. Um, the, the impetus to move is only going to grow. Um, our species is going to need to move. And then there's sort of a question, which is how do we think about creating um, a cultural context in which the coming movement will be less violently resisted than would otherwise be the case. Because the movement will come. Um, and the question is, how are we going to you know, relate to that movement? And, and, and the last thing I just say on this is, you know, when you talk about Say the Nadia and their story, Say the Nadia story is a story of a first love. And a first love is called a first love because presumably there was a second love, right? I mean, the first love at some point ended, otherwise it wasn't the first love, it was just love. And I think this idea of how do we let go well is something that we have as a culture, human culture turned away from. You know, what is a good letting go mm -hmm. of a relationship, of a home, of an idea of our country, 
Um, you know, how do we let go of things? Because the alternative to say that we kind of animate in this monstrous way a nostalgia to say that, no, no, I will always be young and, you know, Pakistan or America will always be like this. And, um, you know, I can, I can, you know, we will always be in love. Um, if we, if we adopt the position of sort of embracing nostalgia and animating it as much as possible, I think we wind up in a very monstrous place. So for me, part of the task is not to pretend that there won't be violence in the future, um, but to say that, you know, in a world where migration, where movement is going to be part of the human response to the stresses of change, as it has always been, um, how can we begin to introduce a kind of antidote to the violent nostalgia that seems to be gripping so much of, of humanity at this moment? Um, and partly that's because the future has become frightening to us. And because the future has become frightening to us, we turn to the past and we turn to people who will exploit our desire to turn to the past. So part of the answer for me is, is trying to think about a future that's a little bit less frightening to us. Um, you know, to think about change and impermanence and the endings of things, the ending of a first love in this case, that of course is tragic, but also potentially is beautiful and gives birth to something else. And for me, that really is at the heart of, of, of what I think we have to wrestle with really as a human uh, community at this time. I, I think that really, that really resonates with me. And there was one passage in the book also that a lot of our book club members kind of pointed to, and it was, um, you know, in, in London, when we kind of observe the second kind of buildup of a crisis and this time spurred by the doors and the amount of migrants heading into London. And you said, perhaps they had decided that they did not have it in them to do what would have been needed to be done to corral and bloody and where necessary slaughter the migrants and had determined that some other way would have to be found. Perhaps they had grasped that the doors could not be closed and new doors would continue to open. And they had understood that the denial of coexistence would have required one party to cease to exist. And the extinguishing party too would have been transformed in the process. And too many native parents would not have been able to look their children in the eye to speak with their head held eye of what generations had done. Or perhaps the sheer number of places where the doors were now been had made it useless to fight in any one. And I, I think that's kind of what for me when I said before it brings me hope is exactly what you're saying is this idea that it doesn't, you know, we can step away from I think sometimes what we struggle with like you're a migrant, you're an IDP, you're a refugee, so you're othered and you're othered from each other. And then you're a host community and you're not and this world where, you know, there's also this kind of short termism and remembering who's displaced from what and there's been questions like when does displacement end if you've been displaced for 25 years are you still an idp how what does that look like and i think you just opened up this other world maybe not less violent or not less complex but one where we're all moving with that that change constantly and that that really resonated with me So, you know, Anna and Ruth, kind of how, what, how, how do you, how do you see this in that way? Ruth. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I agree with you. And someone in the chat actually also just put there that vision of a world without borders. Um, and, 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 and I wonder sometimes one day if that's what um what we should be aiming for uh, a borderless world where we can actually move in and out of the different spaces but one thing i did want to mention as well was you know the book also just does this um i mean said and, and nadia have this really beautiful relationship and love and, you know, when you talk about, you know, I hadn't thought about, you know, you know, letting go in a good way. And, and that's so true. You, you know, they have their struggles, but they still are respectful and care for each other a lot. 
But there was also a moment, Said and, uh, and Nadia are so different. And I think on page 159, one of the things that I was thinking about as well is for Nadia, and I'll just read quickly, I know we're running out of time, but I'll just read quickly 159 where it says, and it occurred to her that she had been stifled in the place of her birth for virtually her entire life, that this time for her had passed and a new time was here and thought or not, she relished this like, this like the wind in her face on a hot day when she rode her motorcycle. And I just wanted to quickly mention it as well because there is also that kind of, um, of uh, openness for her in terms of what she is gaining and perhaps not necessarily thinking about what she has lost in her old life or in her homeland where she felt stifled, but actually quite open to the new opportunities that may come up for her um, as, as you know, in, in these two different countries or different places that she lives in. And as I just kind of quickly wanted to just quickly say as well, that is something that humanity is also embraced, you know, their capacity to adapt, to, 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 to be resilient, to be welcome, you know, to, to welcome new experiences and new adventures which I also want to say perhaps helps us to cope with the different situations that uh, people find themselves in. Well, we just have a, a few minutes left. Um, and so I kind of just, you know, want to open it if there was anything else that, that you all wanted to kind of add at the end here. Um, you know, I think just one thing that I um, did want to perhaps uh, 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 touch upon um, is that I think that at this point, you know, in, in human history, we're seeing the coming together of all different kinds of people. You know, my kids in Pakistan are watching, you know, Turkish dramas and Korean dramas, and they're watching, you know, Spanish TV, and they're seeing, you know, um, and, uh, and I think the idea that we need to find ways to imagine together is very important. Um, not that I have some answer to what that imagining should be, but I think as an undertaking, it's very important. And, and I'm, you know, I'm very, I guess, excited to be part of this conversation and to be speaking you know, uh, with, with all of you, um, because I do still think that, that books are one of the ways in which we do come together to imagine differently. And, um, and I think just that act of trying to imagine our stories together, to write them, to read them, to talk about them um, is enormously useful. You know, there, there's, there's a real danger of, of pessimism in this current moment. And the danger of pessimism is if we say everything is so bad, it's going to get worse. Um, in a way, we're just enabling a, 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 the furtherance of this political nostalgia. Of, you know, let's go back to our golden age when Pakistan was the real Pakistan and America was the real America, et cetera. So Russia was the real Russia. Um, and I think that's very dangerous. And so, you know, I guess the thing I'd just like to close with, I suppose, um, is, to, is to say that we almost have um, a duty to be optimistic not foolishly optimistic, but to attempt to find optimism. Because if we don't attempt that, um, in a sense, we enforce a pessimistic politics, which I think is a great danger. So, um, you know, when, when, when Ruth and Anna were speaking and we were talking about, I think, you know, these ideas of, of how will the word world turn out? Um, uh, it's not that each, any one of us will shape how it turns out, but I think having a stance that, that says that, look, optimism, a kind of hard-won optimism, is not optional. It's almost essential for humanity to move forward. Um, it's something that I think is very important and, 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 worth, um, you know, and worth just touching upon, I guess, before we finish today. Thank you so much, and thanks for ending us on that note. Um, it's been so wonderful to talk to all of you. And Thank you so much to all those who are listening and our Read for Action community. Um, it's, it's like, it's incredibly heartwarming to kind of have this project going and connect with all of you on these issues.
So thank you so much to everybody. And I hope that the rest of your day is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.